Now this week we've come down to the city of London to Wood Street, a Wood Street police station. And we've come up to the museum. It's a small room, and I say small, it's about, what, 40 feet long, and I suppose about 12 feet wide, surrounded by glass cases with many trophies, some of them a bit gruesome. I mean, there are guns and knives and death masks and truncheons and uniforms. Now with me is PC Don Rumbelow. He is the keeper of the museum. But can we just go back, before we look at these various trophies, go back on the origin of the police, the city police, the metropolitan police. They come really out of the old, what, Bow Street Runners, is it? Yes, more, more or less. They uh, were built up of a sort of mixture of the old Bow Street horse, horse and foot patrol, the early peelers, and uh, the Thames Division. Uh, that's uh, the makeup of the present Met Metropolitan Police Force. In the old Bow Street Runners, they were, how do you put it, they were commissioned by or they were designed or what, licensed by whom? Well, they were founded in the 1740s by the uh, Fielding brothers, John and Henry. Henry is best remembered today as the author of Tom Jones. John, as you can see from the uh, print in one of the cases, was blind, but it was said that he could recognize over 3,000 criminals by their voices alone. The original number of Bow Street uh, runners was only six, and uh, the names of four of those had to be kept secret because of uh, fears of what the public might do to them. And they were modelled on the city marshal and marshalmen who uh, were sort of heads of the police in the city of London. By the end of the 18th century, they had become purely a private detective force, again the same as the city marshal and marshalmen. Later on, uh, in, in the early 1800s, uh, they would, there was formed uh, a Bow Street horse and foot patrol. So you have these private detective force often being confused with the Bow Street horse and foot patrol. And then finally, if I was to say around about the 1830s, uh, the private detective disappeared, the Bow Street horse and foot patrol disappeared, and they were all merged with the Metropolitan Police. Well, now, we've got an old uniform here. This is the old Pilar uniform, I take it, is it? It's a long frock coat with black buttons and a top hat, rather a battered top hat, which he appears to be hanging on to by a wooden arm at the most moment. But this is one of the original uniforms, is it? Yes, indeed. It's an inspector's uh, night coat. Uh, it's, in, in fact, sort of charcoal grey, almost black. Uh, normal colour, of course, was blue. Round his neck I is a stock, a leather stock, which was worn to prevent garroting. In fact, I I I in one division, um, things were so bad uh, at one time that uh, the policemen were made to wear brass collars covered with fish hooks. Mm -hmm. The top hat, of course, was very battered, is, is very battered and very broken. It was worn until the mid-1860s when there was the changeover to the Britannia or comb helmet, which the city police still wear. Yes. As you can see, it got knocked about quite easily, and the policemen got headaches with, with these top hats. And so they had little ventilation buttons put in at the side. You can see one uh, oh, yes. at the top. <laughs> yes. And uh, th that's how we can date this yes. one to 1851. Yes. Now, can we pass on one or two of these other cases? Now, this case here, which has got a whole series of photographs, very old, daguerreotype type of photographs at the bottom. And then uh, there's some ugly-looking chains and bars and a sword and cartoons and some photographs and pictures and so on. What, what do these all represent? Well, the chains are, in fact, leg irons from the 18th century, and they were dug up uh, on the side of the old bailey. The leg irons, of course, uh, were worn by the prisoners, and these, have, uh, these leg irons are made of three large links, and they would be fastened from uh, the waist to the ankle. Prisoners, actually, in the sort of the 17th and 18th century, could be charged rent for the use of their chains. <laughs> and uh, there is one authenticated case of uh, a prisoner actually serving his sentence and then being detained for another 20 years in the prison before he was released. He, he, well, he wasn't released, he died in prison. Well, he couldn't uh, be, pay be, could, Because he couldn't pay uh, the money he owed to the jailer. Yes. The criminal records album is of thieves who were working in the city in the 1860s and 1870s. Prisoners couldn't be identified by fingerprints. Uh, fingerprints weren't uh, in use until 1905. So this year album is in many ways unique. These photographs were taken on the day of sentence at the Central Criminal Court at the Old Bailey. The photographer would take a full-length photograph, you've got two there. The head and shoulders would then be cut off and mounted on a card, and this would be numbered. Then you would have uh, details of the prisoner, William White, street thief, 20 years old, 5 foot 4 high, brown hair, hazel eyes, fair complexion. Yes, this would be the sort of criminal record. And this it? would be the criminal record, yes. yes. Now we come to something which is really pretty grim. It's got uh, the death masks of Newgate Jail. 
And because uh, the last hanging was when? Public, uh, public, public hanging. Public hanging was 1868, uh, with a Fenian called uh, Michael Barrett. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> Michael, if you're listening, um, I don't know if it's a relation of yours, but I suspect it is not. <laughs> now, here's a collection, pretty grim. I won't describe all this. It's just really pretty grim a collection with a lot of knives uh, and a lot of most unpleasant weapons, uh, sort of whips and all these extraordinary things. Were these criminal in criminal use and knuckle dusters as well? Yes. These are fairly old, I suppose, aren't they? Uh, no, some of them are quite, uh, some of them are quite modern. Uh, as, you, as you can see, a cosh can be anything from a, a strap from the underground uh, yes. to a leather-covered, lead-tipped, uh, spring-loaded cosh. And then there are various um, bottles of various bits and pieces of people and their clothes who were shot or stabbed or something like that, I presume, aren't they? Yes, indeed. Uh, this one, for instance, sort of emphasises that that is all it takes to kill a man, sort of being stabbed, just yes, a small a piece, cut like that. It's a piece of cloth, really, is it? No, and it's a piece of skin. It's a piece of skin, is it? And it's got a stab wound in it, or only about an inch long, that's all, and yes. about a quarter of an inch wide. Um, that's a killer. That's a killer. Most people don't realise they've been stabbed. In fact, one of our detectives, about four years ago, had to have uh, 96 stitches in his leg after a fight on an underground platform in the early hours of the morning. And when the wound was made, he, he didn't even know that it had been done. Oh, they're pretty vicious, those things, too, aren't they? Now, here's something which is much more up-to-date, obviously, because it's in a tin biscuit box. And uh, it's rather like a in, inside of a thermos flask, sort of silver thermos flask, with a watch attached to it. Now, tell us about that, Don. Well, this is... Uh, uh, a bomb that was sent to a city business firm. It is, in fact, a thermos flask uh, container in the uh, middle of the box. It, it was packed with explosive. It was connected up to a clock and battery and uh, could have gone off quite easily. We were very lucky it didn't. Um, we have another one up in the corner there, mm -hmm. uh, which is a long black pipe. In fact, it, it's, a, it's a heavy metal pipe which was sent uh, to one of the newspapers uh, as a warning uh, yes. about certain articles they were writing. And the only thing that uh, the bomb was left out was the explosive. Then there's also, in this case, there's a, a, a policeman's helmet, and the side of it is completely blown out. Uh, you can see how it's more or less how the thing is made. It's, uh, it looks to be like cork. Is it cork? And, yes, it's uh, cork. And cloth over it. Yes. And the whole of the side of it had been blown out. Now, that, you'd think that with that, that the side of the policeman's head was blown off as well. No, he, he was very lucky. Uh, this uh, bomb was, uh, sorry, this helmet uh, was damaged like this at the Old Bailey bombing in 1963. Uh, the policeman, Malcolm Hine, was very lucky not to be killed. Um, he almost lost, he had to have a leg amputated, um, but he's got 80% use of it back. But that's just what blast, just blast, it wasn't hit with anything, uh, did to his helmet. He, in fact, came off a lot better than um, our photographer, who was only 20 feet from the car and who had something like 300 pieces of metal in him. Good. Oh, that's the old Bailey one, isn't that's it? Old that's a really yes. talking to modern yes. times, isn't it? Yes. But uh, did he lose his hearing of a year of this policeman here? Uh, he yes, he lost uh, hearing, in, uh, hearing in one ear, partial hearing in the other, mm. and he had, uh, as I say, he's just had his tenth operation. Oh, my goodness me. Standing in the room here, that is what, um, it's really like a doll's house. It's wooden, perfectly plain wooden. It's got uh, two houses, obviously, side by side. And they've got a pent roof on one, and then there are four windows in each building, and then below it there are two shops. One is uh, Harris, R.S. Harris, and the other is the Blue House, Bernstein and Company. It's a perfectly plain wooden thing, and doesn't look very exciting. But it was, in fact, a model of the houses, which is one of the most famous occasions in London, which was connected with the late Sir Winston Churchill as well, when he was Home Secretary. And, of course, you've guessed it by now, the Sydney Street Siege. Now then, tell us something about that. We know about, about the name of Peter the Painter, who seemed to be the character about it. But what is the story that lay behind the origin of the Sydney Street Siege? How did it start and why? Well, it started here uh, um, in Houndsditch on the 16th of December 1910, uh, when a gang of foreign revolutionaries, uh, they were all, with one exception, they were all anarchists, tried to rob this shop, Harris's, uh, in Houndsditch. And they were hoping to rob the safe, the, the safe, the jeweller's safe, of about seven thousand pounds worth. It was of a jeweller's shop, was it? Yes, it was a jeweller's shop. Mm -hmm. And the gang had rented two houses at the back, the, yes. that, and uh, they were breaking through the back wall. But they were heard breaking through, and when the police went to investigate, uh, the gang shot their way out. They killed three policemen and crippled two others for life. Um, in the fighting. One of the constables caught hold of the leader of the gang, a man called Gardstein, and that's his portrait 
on the wanted poster. The 500 pound reward, yeah. The 500 pound reward, yes. The policeman was shot eight times and he was still holding on to Gardstein when he fell back. And as he fell back, a bullet aimed at him hit Gardstein and he was taken off by his gang, a, a dying man. And his body was found the next day in a house in the East End. And that's when that photograph was taken in the mortuary. That is actually of the dead Gardstein. Mm -hmm. He was the leader of the gang, was he? Yes, he was the leader of the gang. They were, they, 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 they were all from the Baltic state of Latvia, and they'd been caught up in the 1905 revolution. Now, you said that they, uh, the, these chaps, Peter the Pedersen, so tried to shoot their way out, Garstein and so on. They didn't get out, but they shot, got rid of the police, oh. is that it? No, they, they, no, they shot, they, 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 they got out, and they went into hiding. And within the next two weeks, five men and three women were caught for their, their, their part in the, in the murders. And then on the 2nd of January, two of the gang were trapped, traced and trapped in a house in Sydney Street, again in the East End, but it's all about three miles away. The house was surrounded. Uh, the gunmen refused to surrender. And in fact, there was a big gun battle in the East End, lasting some six to seven hours. Winston Churchill, uh, who was Home Secretary, gave permission for Scots guards to be brought up from the Tower of London uh, to return the gunmen's fire. That was because the police were so badly armed. Uh, the Scots guards turned up in force. They even brought a field gun to shell the house. The battle ended when one of the gunmen was killed and the house caught fire. And the remaining gunmen continued firing out through the flames right up until the last minute when, rather than surrender, he sat down in the kitchen at the back of the house and suffocated to death in the smoke. He went down with all, um, with all flags flying. All fact, flags really. flying. Mm. And uh, these, are, in fact, are two of the three guns that were taken out of the ashes of 100 Sydney Street. Of the five men and three women in custody, they were all tried uh, and they were all acquitted. What about Peter the Painter? Well, he disappeared into the East End. He was last seen borrowing a half a crown uh, to, to, to take a bus to uh, sort of Bethnal Green. Somebody once said if he'd been called Albert the Greengrocer, nobody would have remembered him. The interesting person in the story is, is a man called Jacob Peters, who was the cousin of the Fritz of Ars, the man who suffocated in Sydney Street. Jacob Peters was the only one of those involved who wasn't an anarchist. He, in fact, was a Bolshevik, a devoted follower of Lenin. He was also unique in that he was the man who fired the bullets into Bentley Tucker and into Choate's back. Mm. He got away with murder. Six years later, he went back to Russia as the Bolshevik delegate from London. Um, in played a prominent part in Lenin's seizure of power. And in three months after the October Revolution, was appointed deputy head of the Chaker with a job of putting down all opposition to uh, Lenin's rule. Marvellous. And he's now to be found in the Soviet history books as the model of what an ideal revolutionary should be, and he is officially classed a hero of October. Charming. Quite charming. Well, of course, it created tremendous headlines at the time, didn't it? And you still see the photographs there, still produced with Churchill peering around the corner, surrounded by a lot of guardsmen. Yes, it was a sensation. Which is, I suppose, you've got down here, probably. Yes, yes. That, that's the one. The first of the two men in top hats is Winston yes, Churchill. Yes, right, yes. Don, I am awfully grateful to you. It's a, it's a fascinating place. Grim, some of it, but it's all real and it's all fact. And that's, you can't get away from that. And I think that when I think of the various trophies that you've got here, and you look at the pages and pages of the people who've got conviction, and when you look at the bombs which are made, well, when you think of all those complications and frightening things that the police have to go through, one can give them absolutely full marks for what they have to do. And when you look at this room and see what they've got, which could have been used to a worse purpose, it's a very remarkable thing. Congratulations, Don Rumbelo, and thank you very much for showing us around. You have been listening to John Snags London. The programme was recorded by Graham Clifford and produced by Roger Clark.